your boss comes to you and says, Hey, we'd like to put you in a management role. All of a sudden you jump from this little fishbowl to this giant fishbowl. And it's not just what you do and your deliverables anymore that matter. It's you have to somehow manage and delegate to your team. And I call this like first time managers syndrome. They just don't know how to delegate because they're used to doing it all themselves. And then their team struggles. Welcome to the Leaders Mindset, where we bring you illuminating conversation with leaders who are making an impact in business and our communities. Today, we're joined by Morgan Massey, CEO and founder of Leadership and Training Concierge. She's a powerhouse in corporate training, development, coaching, and consulting. Morgan, thanks for being here today. Oh, thanks so much, Jason. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. So let's start off with what is a Leadership and Training Concierge? And how can it transform how we think about leadership development today? Absolutely. I love talking about this. You know, I worked, oh, about 15 years in corporate, heading up uh, various talent development organization, talent development teams. And when I was in those leadership positions, I would be the one vetting vendors to come in and do training and executive coaching for my team. And I always thought, man, there are so many vendors out there and coaches out there, and it seems like they are very competitive with each other. And so if I ever had the chance to, I would create something that enabled them to build a network and collaborate with each other versus have to compete for my business as, you know, as that business leader. And so, you know, long story short, I hired a coach as my executive leadership coach, and she turned me on to the world of coaching, went in and got certified as an ICF coach and thought, huh, I could probably do this whole consulting and, and coaching thing. And so I ended up starting my own business, getting my own uh, uh, clients and really wishing that I had done that years sooner. And so then the leadership and training concierge was born and I was able to put that vision that I had had so many years earlier to life. And so, yeah, I provide everything talent development. So that's why it's leadership and training. So you're coaching team development and you're training um, uh, for, for all levels of leaders and employees. And what we can't offer in house, I built this long standing, credible network of other coaches and trainers and, uh, and consultants that I will refer to, and we develop those referral partnerships so that we can do work together for clients that love what we do. And so kind of in a nutshell, that's what the concierge part is. If I can't do it, I will source it out for you. Well, one of the things that's really interesting to me as someone who offers coaching and leadership training is what do you find are the things that are in common between a lot of coaches and trainers? And what do you find are the areas that are unique where you, you feel like you need to reach out to somebody else? things that are in common between leadership trainers and coaches. Is that, is that the question? Yeah. What, what do you find is most common where there's overlap and where do you find uh, the areas of uniqueness that um, a coach like me or a trainer like me could, could uh, take advantage of to make ourselves more unique and differentiate ourselves in the market? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are a billion executive coaches out there. And, you know, what I've seen is that other coaches and consultants just brand themselves very broadly as executive coach or executive consultant to executive leaders. Um, and I think we could do ourselves a better service by niching down a little bit. Like what service can you provide to executives that they are going to want you for? Um, and that's what I found uh, actually gets gets more of the business, wins more of those contracts, as if you're able to capitalize on your strengths and your skills as a coach. So not only am I an executive leadership coach, but I will specifically help you on negotiation, for example, because that is my area of expertise. And, um, you know, I was a lawyer or an attorney for a number of years or whatever it is that your history shows. And that's the uniqueness that I'm bringing to you. So what I see common a lot of times is just staying too general with your approach and what you do. Um, and I think we've been taught that is to say general so we can always have a solution for our clients. Um, but really those specialties is what wins the business at the end of the day. 
Uh, fantastic. That was hugely helpful to me. I hope it was helpful to our audience, but that was a, a very selfish question I had after, <laughs> after your answer to the question before. So, so uh, you've built an impressive career in training and development. What was your defining moment? When did you realize this was your passion and how did you turn it into a successful business? Yeah. So I have a master's degree in instructional design and uh, an undergrad BA degree in psychology. And so I always knew it had something to do with helping others, training others. For a while, I wanted to be a behavioral training specialist for adults with autism. So I did that for a stint. For a while, I did biofeedback therapy and focused on stress responses. Um, and so I knew I wanted to help people. But when it came down to it, I, I just didn't want to work in the health and wellness industry. I wanted to work with more um, more industry, more corporate industry. Um, and so I, I got a job uh, actually de developing uh, A and C school Navy training mm -hmm. uh, through a, a contract company and uh, kind of worked my way up the ladder to be their head trainer. And from there, I realized like this is what I was born to do. I was born to train others. Um, I'm a quick read. I'm a quick learner, like a lifelong learner. I can soak up that. And then the best way that I learn, you talk about that selfish question that you just asked. Mm -hmm. My selfishness in this is that the best way that I can learn is to teach to others. And since I have such a hunger for learning, what's the best way to do that? Creative career out of teaching. <laughs> so that was my turning point there is realizing my passion is teaching others. Um, and, and then I've turned that into to, uh, several successful businesses, a nonprofit that we'll talk about here a little bit later, and then my leadership and training concierge. Yeah, I was going to ask about that next because your passions go beyond just training people, educating people, and creating businesses around it. You've also founded a nonprofit. How did you turn that vision into reality, and how does it fuel your company's mission, your for-profit company's mission? Absolutely. So the nonprofit actually founded with a colleague of mine, um, and we wrote and developed a model of change. And so the, the book out there is called Change Rhythm, and Rhythm is, all, is in all caps because it's an acronym. We're not going to go into the details right now. Um, but then we founded the, the nonprofit and the model and the book based off of both of our histories, leading and managing organizational change efforts. Uh, leading you know, companies from acquisition to going public and realizing that through all these organizational change efforts, one thing was missing in all these trainings, and that was the personal side to helping people navigate change. And so then the pandemic fell in our laps, and uh, my colleague and I had weekly meetings just mentally checking in with each other. How's it going? How's your family? What's happening here? And we said, man, we need to put this all into a book and a model to help people with this, not just within organizations, but just help people develop resilience through change and adversity. Well, during that period of time, like five or six year period of, of time, uh, a couple of years before the pandemic and then pandemic, my family lost a, a home in the campfire in Northern California. And uh, although thankfully we were renting the house at the time, but our renter, our tenants lost everything and we lost the property. And that was just really, really tough on, on all of us. Um, and another reason that we're looking out there for resources to help people through, through change and build resilience. And there really wasn't accessible offerings. And so the nonprofit was born to be able to provide community service and free coaching to people going through adversity with our change rhythm model. Uh, and it just opened up opportunities for us to partner with other certified coaches and um, help, help them get hours for their coaching certifications through that pro bono coaching program through change rhythm um, and then help spread the message of how no matter what our adversity is we can get through and build resilience through that change uh change event um, and it's just it's connected a lot to the work that i do with leadership and training concierge um, and just kind of bringing that personal touch to coaching um, and helping people navigate change in that more humanistic way through organizational change as well. So they're really two complementary, you know, offerings and ways that I can service people. Yeah, that campfire a few years ago, that was that was such a tragedy. And it's 
amazing that you've made so much good come out of that with coming out of the pandemic and coming out of a loss like that. And if it weren't enough that you weren't doing, you were doing all those things, you're also working on a PhD in leadership. <laughs> What's the most game changing insight you've discovered from your research that leaders need to hear right now? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting. I've been studying a, a lot of different focus areas through my PhD. And one thing that consistently comes up that was surprising to me, because you, you kind of know, you have your own, I don't know, bias in your mind of what type of leadership works and what doesn't and what tactics work and doesn't. But when you see the research backed behind specific tactics, it was really an eye opener for me. So the most game changing insight was the importance, tangible importance of emotional intelligence in leadership. And, you know, some folks are like, you know, they're of the camp and we're mindset of, you know, emotional intelligence isn't really necessary. You know, you're leading a team. There's, uh, we have uh, tangible deliverables. We have our, you know, our revenue and our bottom line that we need to focus on. Who cares about EQ? But the research has shown that leaders who understand and manage their emotions well, as well as help to manage and coach those emotions and triggers on their teams, they're gonna foster more resiliency, have a more adaptive work environment. As a result, they're gonna see less turnover, more higher engage it, engagement, um, higher performing teams as measured by their end of year performance scores, um, which does impact the bottom line and the success of your team. And so that, that was a real eye opener for me because before that I thought it was like, oh, just soft skills. Who needs to focus on that? <laughs> It's uh, one of my favorite parts now that I do what I do is looking at the research, learning about the research, following the conclusions of the research and what comes out of it and watching that research confirm all of the anecdotal leadership lessons I learned yes. in my 20 years in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's so, so impressive to me that that we somehow knew these things in the air force. And now the research is telling us, yes, we were right about it. And it's always amazing to me that out in the corporate world, people are trying to push emotions aside because there were, there were times we had to do that in the military. There were times we had to say, this isn't about feelings right now. This is getting the job done. But also when it wasn't those times, I learned very quickly coming on active duty in the air force that we had commanders who were interested in how people's home lives were going what yeah. what was going on in their lives what what problems they might be having that might have an impact on getting the mission done and their relationships with the other people in the squadron or their unit so it's all that's always strange to me how uh whenever i run across that in corporate and i actually have to bring this back a little bit when i go work with the air force i do a managing conflict course with them and one of the first things we say and we continue to say throughout the workshop is remember we're not trying to be emotionless mm -hmm. We're trying to understand emotions and understand where people's motivations and interests are coming up from and use our own humanity to connect better with people and yeah. manage conflict. Yeah. It's, it's interesting if I can have one more, one more point there. So when I was working with an organization leading that talent development function, occasionally we would hire authors to come in and do a book club. And we, um, we had Steve Farber come in. And uh, I'll never forget it. We did a book club around one of his books. It's called Radical Leap. No sponsorship here. I just really liked the <laughs> book and it made a mark on me. So Steve, if you're listening, hello. So, um, uh, But Steve Farber, he, he teaches all about love in the workplace and like how there is a place for love and that humanness and that connection in the workplace. And there's one thing that he had as a part of his books um, that I, I have engraved on a, a bracelet and I tell it to almost all of my clients and it's something around do what you love in service of those who love what you do. And that in itself can be applied to leadership and your team and how you hire and how you really have that love and appreciation for your employees and how that just, you know, makes all the difference in that engagement and how they will produce for you um, and, and how you'll have a more successful team. Um, so it's, it all, again, kind of all connects back to that emotional intelligence and, and, treating people how you would like to be treated and understanding your emotions and triggers. Yeah. Ultimately in leadership, we're all in a people business. If you're working with other people, you're in the people business and we work with other people because we're doing things that we can't achieve on our own. Mm -hmm. So 
So you had a lot of success in corporate, but entrepreneurship can be a little bit different. Starting your own business can be a little bit different. What's the biggest challenge you faced as an entrepreneur and how did you turn that struggle into a success story? Yeah, for sure. Um, so not only am I an entrepreneur, but I decided to you know be crazy and, and start working on my PhD while I'm starting my businesses as well. So it's like that balance has has been a big challenge. But I think with regards to just the entrepreneurship journey there, one of the biggest challenges that I faced is uh, early on, I, I think I kind of fell victim to paying paying prices for coaches and solutions and technology um, that I really didn't need as an entrepreneur. Um, I really needed to take the time and, and build out my own content, my own services and gain that confidence that I have what I need for my clients. And as soon as I made that pivot to refocus on putting my core strengths out there and putting myself out there, that's when my business kind of turned the corner from feeling like I was putting all of my effort on developing myself to actually winning business and, and attracting those clients that I love working with. Yeah, it's it's so important to get out there and to to just do it. And we hear that advice all the time, but we hear it all the time because it's true. And you you can take all the training, you can work with all the coaches, but until you really put yourself out there and take that risk and and put it in put what you're offering in front of people and get a yes or get a no or get a get a I would, but it needs to be better. Yeah, uh, it's it's you you just have to get out you just have to get out and do it and i know, i know that's cliche advice but sometimes cliche advice is the best advice we can get exactly i was just talking to um a, a colleague of mine earlier this morning and you know we were reflecting on how business development is hard <laughs> And it doesn't matter if you consider yourself um, a, an introvert or an extrovert. Like now, most of us are working from home. And so we're in our office. Obviously, I'm in a corner in one of my rooms right now. Um, and it can be so much more difficult to literally put yourself out there in the community and find those networking opportunities um, like Secret Knock in Las Vegas, where we were just a couple of weeks ago, right? Like that putting ourselves outside of our comfort zone in a new network of people and just getting that practice to interact. Um, it's, it's so needed. And that's what's going to help us scale our, our business is just for me, I had to create monthly goals around what am I going to do to put myself out there in the community? Because if I don't put those goals I will stay here like a little hermit and run mm -hmm. all my virtual programs and never meet anyone new. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's fantastic advice. Secret Knock was a great experience, and what was amazing to me is everyone not not only was everyone so welcoming, but they were so encouraging, and they were really they were really encouraging people to tell them what their ask was. What is your ask? Mm -hmm. And you have to get out and make that ask. Mm -hmm. So, without naming any names. Can you share one of the toughest client challenges you've ever faced and the leadership breakthrough that helped you solve it? Yeah, this is an interesting, interesting one. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't know that there was a leadership breakthrough. It was more of a personal realization, <laughs> but I'll, but I'll go, kind of go into the, into the story. Um, so I was, uh, coaching for a time with a group of other coaches and we were on a, like a bigger coaching project proposal with a client. I'll leave the names out of it, but a pretty, pretty well-known organization, tech company. And I was uh, responsible for coaching one of their, uh, vice presidents. And literally she was maybe on an eight month roadmap to retirement. And she had her sights set on going on some cruise, uh, you know, down, the coast of Italy somewhere with her husband and her daughter or something like that. But she had, and, you know, rightfully so she's excited about it. The next period of, of time. Right. Um, but she had recently received through our 360 uh, feedback process, um, some really pointed feedback of how she needed to make some dramatic changes and how she was relating to several of her directors who had large stake in, in the company with their organizational knowledge and their tenure. And they each had one or maybe one and a half feet out the door because of how she was treating them. And so the, the 360 feedback was like, you got to shape up before you leave. 
Um, and her motivation was like, I don't care. Eight months will just slide by. But from the organization standpoint, within eight months, we could lose those two directors that we really need to help carry our services forward. So what I realized through that at the end of the day is we can give someone what I like to call those penetrating messages and be real flat out and honest with them around if you don't make any changes, this is going to impact your performance and the team of your and, and the performance of your team. Um, but if they're not ready to receive those messages, what do you do? They're not ready. You can't move forward. I don't know. Jason, I'll ask you, like, have you been in this situation before where they are just so rooted in no, I am not going to change? <laughs> Yeah, well, I was an Air Force officer for 20 years, so I think I know a little bit of a little bit of something about that. Um, we have uh, we have some people very set in their ways. We have some really great leaders as well who are very forward thinking, very open to feedback. But the the phenomenon you talked about is not exclusive to the corporate world. We would call it retired on active duty when we were in the military, because we would get leader what well, we would get uh, leaders at every level who know they're within a year of retiring they've got a retirement date they've got retirement orders and they're just kind of slowly starting to check out more and more and that that would be okay if their teams were completely fully autonomous fully actualized fully fully ready to take on the challenges of what was going on yeah. but you've also got to leave the place better than you found it and that's the message i like to use a lot when yeah. we when we find people who are kind of set in their ways is you know we're you're going to move on at some point how are you going to leave the place better than you found it and what's going to happen when you go uh whether that's someone who is has a date that they're planning to go or in the military you use the term what happens if you get hit by a bus a lot right yeah. so and those are those are kinds of some of the prompts to get people thinking that i like to use is what happens if you get hit by a bus right how will how is this mission going to continue without you and for some folks it's it's exhilarating it's a little intoxicating to be the center of everything so when they start to step out they don't realize that they they have created this world this team where they are the center of everything and that team's not going to be ready for them when they leave yeah yeah we did end up talking a little bit about the legacy that she was leaving behind because that was important to her. She had built this department up from the ground up. And now she's so excited about her retirement that she had kind of forgot that she will be leaving a legacy. And what is the tone of that legacy? But at the end of the day, I mean, I just got to be honest, like, I don't feel like that was a successful coaching engagement. And sometimes they're not because that person is not ready to receive. And I don't think she had any leadership breakthroughs, but I think I did and how to, how to better set up the coaching engagement beforehand to make sure that that person is ready to receive feedback, ready to take action on it, and is in the right mindset. So maybe it would have taken some additional sessions or discussions around mindset before going into the coaching itself or before even reading those three those uh, 360 feedback results. Um, so I learned and I grew as a coach to her probably more than she learned from me. Well, it, sound, it sounds like a success to me. And what it also sounds like is maybe the success and the breakthrough was the folks who worked for her team mm -hmm. saw what was going on. And hopefully some of them made a choice not to make the same choice as she made later yes. on. So, so I don't know if that was, uh, if that was the outcome, but it sounds like the way you described it, that maybe, maybe the success was not with the individual, but with the organization as a whole. And those directors decided to stay. So I'd say that's a win for the organization. <laughs> so, there you go. You, you, yeah. you got that one right. Maybe not yeah. with the individual, but, but yeah. in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's fascinating to me, last week we had, actually this week, yesterday, we had uh, the CEO, the co-founder of a robotics company right here in Las Vegas on. And the, the intersection of how humans and technology and robots are going to work together in the future is fascinating to me. And I could talk about that all day. Yeah. Leadership is evolving as fast as technology shape, shapes the workplace. What's the future of leadership and what excites you most about where we're headed? 
That's amazing. I think AI is all over the place now. And and what was it kind of going back to the secret knock conference? Um, you know, there was someone saying we are really coming close to that intersection of when AI is going to know more than all of humanity across all time. And we're within what, five or six years of that intersection. And that was just like a eye opening moment for me. Oh my, oh my gosh. Um, but you know, I think there's there's always going to be technology and, and there, there's going to be humankind and technology um, and automation and AI is going to continue to reshape a whole bunch of different ways of industry and how we how we interact with each other. Um, but as far as I know, at least in the near future, there it's, it's not going to kind of touch upon, you know, that emotional intelligence need, you know, the need for like understanding how to interact and connect with people, that creativity piece, building empathy in the workplace. Um, and, and really you can ask it for solutions for problem solving, but it's not going to do the work of problem solving with you and your team as of yet in the workplace. So I think that's going to be more important than than ever is and we've learned this through the pandemic too like we need to be more connected with our teams it's not just about giving them tasks and letting them run with it and being completely hands off it's not about micromanaging either but it's about finding that sweet spot of how to engage them give them the proper tools and the technology that they need um, but then enabling them with the right support um, uh, that they need to be successful and that takes that human touch until we all become automated ourselves. Um, I'm super excited of where AI is going. I also, yeah. I, I help professionals uh, write um, and publish their books. And uh, we teach in one of my courses uh, from going from page to stage, how to ethically and responsibly use that generative AI. Cause it can be really helpful. I have one lady I'm working with. She's writing a series of HR books. Um, and she's like, what, what's going to make me stand out amongst all those other HR books out there? I'm like, well, you have a story and you have your experience to lend. Um, but beyond that, you know, you know, we need to make sure that um, that your voice is woven into that, but you can use AI to help you structure your book and your, your book series. Um, but take it a step further than that and make sure you have yourself and your own experiences woven through. So it's a balance between the two. So AI can help us with a bunch of things. It's super exciting. It's a tool we should all learn to, to use, but let's not lose sight of the human part of work as well. Yeah, I think the I think the human part of work will be where we have an advantage for a long time. And honestly, to me, if the AI can figure out empathy and a little bit of the human touch, I think that's a win-win for all of us anyway. I think that would go a long way towards allaying some of the fears that people have about using AI and bringing it into the workplace. But I think it's really exciting and I think the I think the conversation about using AI ethically is an interesting one, but it comes down to some of the basic leadership principles we all know and love and have worked for many, many years that now we're finding some of the organizational uh, organizational psychology research is, is backing us up on the things that have worked for so many years. Yeah. So what do you think is the number one barrier stopping companies from developing future leaders and what's the key to breaking through it? This is, this is an interesting one. Um, I think oftentimes the biggest barrier, it comes down to a lack of investment, being on the inside and running the talent development team. I know that when there are budget cuts to the organization or there's internal change happening, training and coaching services are almost always the first budget. That's the first budget to get cut, um, both in time and in, in resources. Um, and a lot of companies are just so focused on their immediate business needs that they just overlook. You're not going to see immediate ROI for the investment that you give your leaders in leadership development and coaching and training, but there is a long-term importance of nurturing leadership talent. Um, large organizations like Apple and Google and Nike and PayPal like they consistently invest in leadership development and coaching for for their specific senior executives, smaller comp because they have the budget and, and know how and, mm -hmm. and, and ability to do that. And smaller companies, it, that's just that's always on the chopping block. So I think we can learn from those longstanding uh, large businesses about, you know, keys to their success. And one of them being the consistent 
the consistency in investing in that type of talent development for your key staff, your key leaders. Um, <clears throat> when I work with small companies and they're struggling with their budget and you know trying to figure out if it's worth them to hire on an executive coach or some leadership development, you know, we talk about like outcomes first. Like, you know, if you were to reflect back on your on your team and your team's success a year, three years down the line, what would you hope would have happened? Um, what are you going towards? And a lot of times when I can understand where they want to go, I can tie that back into the need for how your leaders need certain skills to be able to help you and your team get there. And how are they on those skills today? And, and where are their gaps? And if you don't know where they are, let's do an initial assessment and kind of, uh, you know, see where the need is and how you can best put the limited budget you have in specific areas where you're going to see that ROI in one to three years of time. Do you think enough leadership development is done with frontline managers and, and future and up and coming leaders? Because that's something we focus yeah. on very much in the military. We do leadership development with everybody, but we especially focus on, and, and to be fair, a lot of people who are just coming to the military don't understand they're getting, when they're getting yelled at and told they have to fold their socks a certain way, they don't understand, they, they don't understand they're getting leadership development at that time. But we, we, we're always doing this. Everything's always a conversation about leadership in the military. And that was shocking to me when I came out and started working with companies is that a lot of their effort is placed on the senior executives, the, the senior director level folks. And there's not almost no effort put into frontline managers where I think you get the most bang for the buck is you, and you build your cultures with your frontline managers. But uh, I, what do you think about that? Cause that, that was shocking to me coming out of the military and seeing how it's done in corporate. <laughs> Absolutely. I think companies uh, do, they do typically put their investment in the, the senior leaders and not as much on the front or even those middle um, middle uh, supervisors and, and managers. Um, and I think that's so important because there's this huge gap. I've lived it. Maybe you have as well. So you're an individual contributor. You're doing, a, you know, doing great work. You're um, poised for promotion. Your boss comes to you and says, hey, we'd like to put you in a management role. All of a sudden you jump from this little fishbowl to this giant fishbowl. And it's not just what you do and your deliverables anymore that matter. It's you have to somehow manage and delegate to your team. And I call this like first time managers syndrome. They just don't know how to delegate because they're used to doing it all themselves. And then their team struggles. Or I've seen some which over delegate. So you put them in a management position, they all of a sudden feel like they're on this pedestal and that their team needs to do everything for them. And so they delegate it all off. And then what's the value that that manager brings other than being a person in a role? So I do think we need to have like first time leader, like management 101 courses in all organizations. Um, doesn't have to be super robust, but there are specific keys that they need to know on how to manage others versus just managing yourself. And then those middle managers, and I've been there too, you're getting it from all angles. You're being directed and, and delegated to, and then you have to pass that down. And you also have to communicate upwards as well. And I sometimes think the hardest level of leadership and management is that middle management role. And what what are we providing to them to help them be successful? That's in a very stressful, potentially stressful position in an organization. Yeah, middle managers have it harder than the front well, front line managers. Fortunately, I have a course. I have a program for front line managers for new managers, which I I think is a pretty good one. But uh, middle managers have it have it hard because they are caught in the middle. And what I what I have found when I look back on my career in the in the military, and I look with some of the the organizations I work with is uh, trying to get them to think a little bit more strategically, a little bit more big picture. Mm -hmm. helps them out as well as as uh once they know how to delegate and they're thinking strategically now they know what to delegate so yeah middle managers have it tough but I, i've got a course for them too so uh if anybody's anybody's listening so all right well let's take a break from the from these questions and let's play a little bit of a game okay if you're willing <laughs> the game is called rapid response okay and what we're going to do uh, i'm going to ask you a question 
And you're just going to respond with the first thing that comes into your head. Now, that doesn't mean you need to give one word answers. You can give longer answers. Sometimes sometimes we get people given one word answers on this. And I so feel, we're, we're just looking for your first reaction to the question. Okay. okay. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Morgan Massey, rapid response round. Your time starts now. A podcast everyone should listen to. I really like, oh, what is it? Um, Brene Brown's Unlocking Us. Um, and it's popular right now. It kind of dives deep into what I've been talking about, the human side of leadership, vulnerability, and, and connection. She has a lot of research that backs that backs that up. So that's my favorite currently, although there's lots that I like. Well, I love to, like I said, I love to see the research backing out, backing up what we've all known for a long time and reinforcing it. One leadership lesson you wish you'd learned sooner. Well, going back to what we just said, the importance of delegating. You can't do everything yourself <laughs> and trying is only going to lead you to, to burnout. So how can you leverage the strengths of your team? As my dad would say, you hire the thoroughbreds and let them carry your team forward. Love it. Don't, don't learn it the hard way like Morgan and I did. <laughs> Something we should all start paying more attention to. I think from from just us entering into this post pandemic era, it's just mental health and well being in the workplace. I think leaders in particular need to create environments where people feel um, psychologically and mentally safe and, and supported so they can thrive. Good one. I like it. Okay, so you get a choice here. Either, don't answer yet, your get psyched up song that you always turn to, or your walk on music. Oh gosh, um, get psyched up song. Uh, right now, I like "Girl on Fire." Who's that? Alicia, 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 Alicia Keys. Um, it's got energy and confidence. Um, and I had a TEDx that just dropped a couple days ago. If you if you do Morgan Massey TEDx on on YouTube, um, and there's "Girl on Fire" has some connection to my 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 TEDx. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. All right, well, we'll link that up in the show notes so everyone can go see what that's all about. A book that changed your life. I love all sorts of books, but since we're on kind of like a Brene Brown kick, um, I really do appreciate her Dare to Lead book. Um, it, uh, I had to take some time to get through it all. Um, since then, I've co-facilitated some of her programs with some, uh, some trusted colleagues who are um, certified facilitators of her Dare to Lead program. Um, and it just really helped me open my eyes to how I approach leadership and vulnerability in the workplace. Excellent. Favorite fall activity to recharge? My family and I have some acreage and a totally off-grid cabin. Um, and we love to go up there in the fall and have fire, a uh, bonfire and smoke some, do some smoke. Sm <laughs> I'm not trying to say what you say. I don't actually do that. So like marshmallows, marshmallows and uh, um, graham crackers and then go on a hike up Jasper Mountain. Jasper's my son's name um, and go hike to the top of it and uh, look at the outlook on the top of it um, and then take a, an ATV ride around the property. That is absolutely my favorite fall activity. All right. Well, maybe if you watch uh, Morgan's TEDx talk, you'll find out what she does smoke when she's up there. But <laughs> All right. So besides the cabin, what's your next big vacation spot? Next vacation is Oxford, England. So I'm hosting a uh, little writer's retreat uh, uh, the week of uh, Halloween. And I'll also be speaking at Oxford University that, that week, which I'm super excited and looking forward to. Um, but I'm bringing my family and we're doing some little side trips there. And I, I, it's been years since I've been to London. I'm really looking forward to that. And when is, what, what time of year is that? Uh, the week of Halloween next month. Oh, okay. That's a nice time up in, out in England. So mm -hmm. the biggest trend every leader should watch right now. Biggest trend. I mean, I think it's around AI right now, to be honest, like how, and not just how AI is growing, but how can you leverage AI tools 
uh, for to help automate or support what you are doing. I've worked with coaching HR professionals on how they can use that for uh, re or for resume screening uh, to help boost um, uh, to help build their job description or create templates that can help their team work more efficiently. So it's not about taking work away from your people, but like giving them a tool to enhance their communication. Human and ro humans and robots working together side right. by side. I, I love it. That's 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 what the future is going to be. It's coming. And uh, if you don't believe me, check back in eighteen months. That's right. That that might even be a little long of a forecast. So, yes. <laughs> favorite sports team really consistently follow sports but last year my family was pretty split between the Chiefs and the Eagles so I guess I mean in the end my loyalty depends on it's gonna sound really corny um like like how much is stacked against the snacks and in, in the in the kitchen that's where I'll be <laughs> all right well that is the first time we've heard this answer on rapid response so <laughs> Uh, thanks for playing our game. It's always nice to get to know our guests a little bit in a way that maybe the main questions in the interview don't don't uh, bring forward. So thank you for playing. Thank you for being a good sport. So to get back to what we were talking about, what's the biggest leadership lesson you didn't expect to learn when you became an entrepreneur? Hmm. I I think it comes down to how crucial resilience is when I first started my business, I thought, Oh, this is going to be easy. You know, um, I, I know folks from a lot of different companies, they're just going to want to, they, they're just going to see that I've started a business and automatically want to start working with me. And just, I don't know what I was thinking. Like money was just going to rain on me. <laughs> um, but you know, we face so many setbacks, you know, just figuring out what CRM system to use or, you know, hiring someone on and, and realizing they're not the best fit and having to start all over and realizing that you just lost money and in investing in, in someone to help you with your business. Um, things don't always go according to plan. So how can you tap into, you know, not everything's going to be rainbows and butterflies, but just keeping that optimism and saying, what did I just learn from this experience? How can I grow through it? And how can I, um, you know, just stay on that right path forward? Because um, it's it takes a lot of grit to run a business uh, and to be an entrepreneur. That's for sure. Yeah. If you're, uh, if you're thinking about starting a business, it's not like it looks on Instagram or YouTube. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot to it. Um, and I, I went through the same lessons as well. It's to totally worth it. Better person for it. Uh, glad it went the way it went. Mm -hmm. uh, and glad it's going the way it's going, but it's, it's still work every day. It's, it's, you know, what's the saying, uh, an, an entrepreneur is someone who gives up working 40 hours a week for someone else to go work 80 hours a week for themselves and their clients, <laughs> something, something like that. It's, yes. uh, so if you're, if you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, uh, i you know, highly recommend it, but just, just understand you're going to work more than you've ever worked in your life. Absolutely. And if you're, what you're working towards is aligned with your strengths and your passions, man, that upside is just, it, it's, it's so exciting. Um, but there are going to be times where it's, it's going to be work. It's going to feel like work and you got to do all that behind the scenes to make a successful business. Well, it's been a massive year for you. What's your biggest focus for the rest of 2024? And how are you preparing your team for the growth ahead? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So anyone that follows me on, on, on LinkedIn has seen, you know, what, it's just been beyond my, beyond my like goals, you know, being a TEDx speaker wasn't even on my 10, 20 year plan, but that opportunity presented itself. And I am of the mindset where you kind of follow that spark. I was on the NASDAQ uh, New York Times billboard earlier this year, too. Um, and again, not something that I had plans, but an opportunity presented itself. And then here I here I am. So, wow. And all this as I had committed to myself to step back from work to focus on my Ph.D., mind you. Um, 
So for the rest of 2024, um, I think it's continuing to build out different service offerings around helping people get from page to stage, because that has really helped accelerate my growth and my services personally. Um, and also, I've just joined in partnership with uh, some ladies as a part of um, Empowered Ventures, where we are building a... We're building a directory of women-owned businesses that's going to go national. Um, we're just very excited for how that can connect us and uh, keep that spirit of connectedness and collaboration amongst businesses alive and going. And I think that's going to fuel my success, not just for my businesses, but for other people going forward. So for 2025, and at least for the next couple of years, my focus is on how can I shine the light on others to help them be successful? Because that's what helped me when I had those supporters. I would not be where I am today if it weren't for all those folks that helped to push me down the path of success. And I really just want to repay that now. And so that's my mission. Excellent. Sounds like a sounds like a very exciting year, year and a half coming up. And speaking of shining the spotlight on others, when you're bringing new talent onto your team, what's the one quality that makes someone stand out to you? I, I think it's got to be curiosity. And that came from feedback from my mom when I was a kid, you know, very introverted, quiet child that really kind of grew up in an area with, you know, children are supposed to be seen and not heard. And as I matured, she would always encourage me, you know, ask questions, get curious. Um, and so over the years, I've, I've learned to do that because it didn't come naturally to me. And so now I look for that in people. If I'm hiring someone um, on to my team, whether it be just part-time or volunteer or however they're helping me, I'm going to look for those people that ask questions or can think on their own rather than want me to direct every minute of their day. Because at the end of the day, if I'm running a business and I'm asking someone for help, I'm going to want their expertise to shine here. And if they get stuck, let's, let's brainstorm together. But I know I don't have all the answers and I don't expect them to as well. So can we get curious together? That's what makes people stand out in my opinion. I love that. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. I think that initiative to, to go find out what, what the root causes of problems are and what, what the possible solutions are, and then to take action on them is, is so important. I think curiosity is such an important trait for anyone in the workplace. And contrary to what a lot of people think it can be developed, you can kind of develop that in yourself and you can develop that in your team. So yep. let's, uh, let's mark curiosity up on the board as, as a quality <laughs> we all like, we would all like to see our teams have our, our individual team members have. Mm -hmm. What's a mistake that turned into a golden opportunity for growth and how did it shape who you are today? Interesting. Let me think for a minute. I think early on in my business, maybe going back to a question that we answered before, you know, I, I felt like I invested my time or energy or funds in services that weren't really aligned with my strengths or my passions. And as a result, wasted a lot of time and energy um, on, on trying to trying to make those things work. Um, and it felt like a mistake at the time. So, you know, for example, I invested a lot of time and energy in working, partnering with a company that I thought was going to help me build a, a year long program that I would be able to then add as my, one of my services on my webpage. And I kind of saw some red flags from, from the start that they really weren't aligned in my best interest. And they made almost every step of the process so freaking difficult um, that the t like the eight months that I spent trying to build this course, like I have a master's in instructional design. I could have busted it out in four months or less, but I was trying to go with their process. And it's almost like they wanted they wanted more of my time, more of my energy, more of my free IP that I was sharing with them. And then at the end, they wanted my money. And that was a mistake. Um, and so it really, that mistake made me realize this gold, going back to the golden opportunity is like, I don't 
have to rely on other people or, and I, if I feel like someone's not aligned with what I am and what I stand for and what I'm trying to do for my services, then I don't have to work with them. Um, I just need to leverage my strengths and uh, what, what I bring to the table to create my services, to create those partnerships. Um, it was really like a, a big self development, self realization moment for for me. Um, I don't always have to look outside for help and support. It's all it's all here, and I need to just go deeper here. And just when I started doing that, that's when the services fell into place. The partnerships that connected more with my strengths and passions started coming out of the woodwork, and I was able to move forward a lot smoother. What a fantastic lesson that I think every entrepreneur needs to learn, right? Is every leader needs to, needs to learn really is you don't you don't have to work with people. You no. if they if if they if they aren't aligned with what you're doing, it's it's perfectly fine to say no thank you. We'll maybe we'll find something to work on in the future, but not this thing. Yeah. And I think at this with this particular uh, group I felt like I had invested so much time and energy that it was almost an embarrassment to say I don't think this is working. It's like a relationship. You know, like, it's not you, it's me. Sorry, we got to, we got to part ways. And I was embarrassed and ashamed to, to feel like I had gone that far with them and, and uh, was leading them on almost. But as soon as I kind of stood my ground and had more of that confidence and saying, this is not working for me, we're not aligned. Um, it was such a relief to move forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got to you've got to get by that sunk cost fallacy. Sunk cost fallacy for all you MBAs, you should know this one. <laughs> sunk cost fallacy. Don't don't uh don't fall into it. I I know I I I've known about it for a long long time and sometimes I catch myself doing it. So so watch out for that. Mm -hmm. Who's a leader you look up to and what's one leadership trait that you they have that you admire most? I admire a lot of leaders. Um, one, and I don't know that he would want me to say his name on the podcast, but was, uh, I, re I recently connected with him. Um, and he was my boss for some time at this previous organization that I worked with. And, uh, he saw something in me and gave me opportunities to develop my, uh, senior leadership abilities that previous leaders had not up to that point. Uh, he took what I had come to realize as a, like a strengths based approach with seeing, Oh, Morgan's really good at this. She's good at connecting with others and she has a creative flair and she designs content and services. Let's align her with something that does that and create a role specific for her to allow her unique skills to shine. Following him, I had another leader um, within the same organization um, who was very similar, uh, very strengths focused and enabled me to kind of create my own path. And I'm so grateful for the two of them. Um, and what what I took away from that is of creating a more strengths aligned approach with people that I work with. Um, you know, sim similar to that first conversation that you and I had, it's like, oh, it looks like we have this shared, you know, shared area of leadership development. We both work with, um, with that type of, uh, do that type of work. Um, you know, what do you specialize in and what type of topics do you teach on? And interesting. Or oh, I wonder what kind of collaboration opportunities there might be or how we can help support each other. <laughs> so since working with those two leaders, like that has changed my approach for how to interact with others and how to maximize other people's skills in ways that maybe they didn't initially see. And so I, I love that. And I'm very appreciative. Well, if you didn't believe before, dear listener, dear viewer, uh, believe it now, help developing future leaders is going to make your life better in so many more ways, especially as you start to embrace those lessons as well. Okay. So not everything is success as we talked about. What's keeping you up at night right now? What challenges are you wrestling with and how are you overcoming them? I have a lot of stuff. A lot of irons in the fire, as, as as they say. And when I catch up with friends that I haven't talked to in a while, they're like, "Wow, you have a lot going on. How are you? How are you staying afloat?" And so that is the challenge: is balancing this rapid growth 
that I'm having personally, professionally, and on a business front with maintaining my quality of services and that personal connection with others that really matters a lot to me. Um, I'm trying, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to overcome it by just taking one thing at a time um, and keeping pace with myself. If my body needs a half hour nap since I work from home, I'm going to see how I can book that in, <laughs> do that self-care. So I don't end every day with that ringing in my ears because I'm so overstimulated. Um, delegating where I can to whom I can, but it's like a, it's a, it's a process and it's an active, I'm in active wrestling stage right now. <laughs> I will take all the advice and the help I can get. Well, it sounds like your priorities are in the right place. Connection with others, doing a good job, staying aligned. And, you know, we all feel that stress and staying calm under pressure is a superpower. So what's your secret for staying grounded when everything around you feels chaotic? When things feel chaotic, like I feel it in my body, like the, the ear ringing will all of a sudden start or I'll feel like intense, like tightening in my shoulders. And, um, you know, I teach a class on 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 resilience that goes into resilience has three components. There's self uh, awareness, mindset and connection. And part of the self awareness piece is not just knowing your strengths, like we've talked a lot about today, but knowing what your triggers are. Um, and so I know that those are triggers for me. Uh, so when that's happening, I literally need to get myself out of my immediate environment, wherever I am and like get a breath outside, um, or close my eyes for 30 seconds and just recenter myself. Um, and I don't think it's woo woo to say that it's like, I really just need to re ground myself within myself. And then I can move forward with my day because I realized when I don't do that, I spin out of control. I get mad and pissy with people. Um, my husband would probably like echo that like times a thousand. <laughs> so like, I know that when I'm in a high pressure situation, I need to do that breathing or that mini meditation first, and then I can stay more calm and composed. Yeah. I don't think that's woo woo at all. I think that's a lesson everyone needs to learn at some point is sometimes you can't remove yourself from the stressful situa situation, but many times you can take five seconds to take a couple deep breaths yeah. and just pause just, just long mm -hmm. enough to reset things a little bit. And then you can come at it from a different direction, come at it from a, a place of being a little more calm and centered. Yeah. So what's the most exciting project or opportunity on the horizon for you right now? Well, there's two. There's my writer's retreat in Oxford that's um, coming up uh, the week of Halloween. Uh, I have a program called My Write Start. Write's an acronym. I love acronyms. I don't know. I'm a nerd like that. Um, to help people develop their you know, uh, best-selling book and then learn what it takes to self-publish or work through a publisher. I kind of share both angles and you can choose your path. Um, and then the other one is my partnership with Empowered Ventures. So we just literally this morning or late last night. I don't know, like time runs together. We literally just launched a website. Um, it's women owned dash business.com. Um, and we have a networking group here in Reno, Nevada, that's grown from zero to almost 3,500 members in under two months. We're launching a national directory of women owned businesses where you can search and give support to those businesses. And for those businesses, we're creating all sorts of help and support to get your business launched, get you the, get you the leadership and self-development and marketing training and all sorts of um, resources that you need to be successful. I'm so excited with this new partnership with my um, co-founders and to see where this is gonna go in, in the next coming months. It's so exciting. Yeah, it sounds really fantastic. It's, it sounds exciting. We're both entrepreneurs. We have growing companies. Uh, we've also worked with uh, some bigger companies. Uh, I worked with the Air Force, which is a big, big organization uh, in its own right. When it comes to building big organizations with meaningful missions, what's the most important piece of advice you'd give future leaders? Gosh, 
Yeah, I definitely think it has something to do with the empathy because we've been talking a lot about that and the emotional intelligence and staying connected to your purpose and your value um, as you build your company, you know, um, stay close to your roots. Why did you create this organization? What are the outcomes that you want to, you know, as far as service delivery to your clients, customers, patients, whatever the term may be for you. Um, but more important than that, when as I'm coaching entrepreneurs and people stepping into entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship for the first time or leadership for the first time. It's really that transition from me to we. And, and I'll repeat that again, because it's so important, me to we, because it's not just about you and your success. You're likely building a team of other leaders that are bringing you, uh, that are helping you to be successful. You may be the top of your organization or close to the top, but it is not just you. And if your organization sees that you're up here and they sense that everyone else is down here, over time, there's there's going to be some disassociation happening there. But the companies that I've seen and the teams and leaders that I've seen that have stayed close knit and true to their roots and true to their values have someone at the top who, when they talk awesomely about their team, it's always from a we standpoint and not a me and my success standpoint. And I really do think that that's like the, that's just key to staying successful in this business landscape. Uh, that's such a, such a powerful lesson, such an important lesson. I think it's one of those things that can never be said too many times. I actually watched a two-star general say that to a colonel in the Air Force, a full colonel in the Air Force, way back when I was a young captain or young major. I don't remember how long ago that was, but we're all susceptible to that. We're all susceptible to it becoming about me and what I've done and what I've achieved. And if we really want our teams to succeed and we want ourselves to succeed, we need to be in the we business, not the me business. I think that's such a such a powerful lesson that can never be told too many times and something if we can't remind ourselves of it all the time maybe we can try to remind some other folks as well so someone just said to me the other day um they they said if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together I forget who said that. We'll try to look it up and put it in the show notes, but I've heard that many, many times. It's a, yes. again, something that can never be said too many times. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up, what's one thing about you and all of your companies or one of your companies or a couple of your companies <laughs> that not many people know, but they definitely should? Um. Well, one of them's in that TED Talk. So go watch first 30 seconds of that TED Talk and you'll you'll see a missing piece of me that I'm not going to mention here because it's going to just drive that thirst to go over there. Um, but uh, another one um, is, you know, I, I'm a watercolor artist and uh, I love to get creative. That's kind of my meditation and I'm not formally trained uh, on that. It's just something fun that ended up being a, a business in its own. <laughs> so, um, and, and really kind of that lesson it's a lesson for for folks that I meet and for I um, for whom I engage with, in, in that all of us have these strengths within us, um, and how can how can you use that to help yourself grow and and develop? I used to be in the point where I would draw something or paint something and I would toss it in the trash because I was so embarrassed and didn't want anyone to see. Um, but after showing it to a few people, they encouraged me to like, oh, you should sell this. Oh, I can never sell that. Like, you can do a lot more than you think you can if you just put yourself out there. And so I guess in addition to one thing about me, maybe it's my one piece of advice as well. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to getting the invitation to come to your gallery showing of your watercolor painting sometime soon. So, right. <laughs> so I am, I am, uh, I would love to come see that. So where can our, uh, where can everyone connect with you and learn more about leadership and training concierge? Absolutely. Um, so you can go to the website. So www.leadershipandtrainingconcierge.com. Might want to do a spell check on that. Make sure you spell concierge right. Um, or uh, you can go to the, the new women-owned business. So it's womenowned-business.com. Um, and uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn, Morgan Massey. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under that same name as well. And I'm, I'm happy to connect with anyone that uh, wants to share uh, some uh, thoughts or opinions on our talk today or, or explore something down the road. 
we'll put all those links in the show notes so nobody has to write them down or try to remember them as they're watching or listening. So Morgan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. If you found value in what Morgan shared today, reach out and make sure to thank her and check out our, also check out our other videos. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Your support helps us continue to bring you these powerful conversations. Also, if you'd like to give us a five-star review on your podcast plat podcast platform, that would really help us reach more people. So keep watching, keep developing your leader's mindset, onward and upward. Thank you.